The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and may we have the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the Word of God into our stream of consciousness. I know we're all a bit tired as it's a bit late. Time got, a, time got away with us just a bit. <clears throat> but I've always known the concept that one is faithful in teaching the Word of God, God will be faithful in providing the hearers, and that He has. And uh, one day I'll give you guys, at least, it won't be part of what goes on the internet, a glimpse of uh, the number of people that the Lord is bringing into the fold quite a few. What we're studying is the fact that during the dispensation of the church age there is the fact that angels observe us and in fact in the church age they crane their heads to observe us as this is the intensified stage of the angelic conflict though for us it's mainly invisible during the post canon period of the church age we're not in the what you would call or what human beings would call a spectacular time because everything's invisible this is dramatically seen at the cross in which when our Lord was bearing the sins of the world he was a visible hero up until that point and then darkness spread across the whole of the earth the sun and stars were blotted out supernatural darkness fell upon the earth and as he cried out Eloi Eloi lama sabachthani everyone was blind no one saw what occurred he utilized the spiritual life to its maximum capacity, all of which was done in invisibility. That same invisible power has been passed down to us, though we will never ever be able to extend it to the far reaches that our Lord did, and nor do we have to, for he accomplished the hard part on our behalf. But he gave us this unique spiritual life, the freedom to live it, as part of the greatest blessing mankind has ever seen in any dispensation or ever will see in any dispensation in the future. For in the tribulation it goes back to the Old Testament, the time of Israel in which for the most part there's the utilization of the faith rest drill only then you go into the millennium which has a different operation totally different operation in the unique spiritual in the spiritual life which will be different in that our Lord will be on the earth and since he will be on the earth there will be it will actually be allowed that there will be tremendous emotional appreciation enhanced 
by God the Holy Spirit, which will have a totally different function in the millennium because the Lord will be on the earth. When the Lord went to be absent from the earth, he said, I will send for you a helper, a mentor, God the Holy Spirit. Since Jesus Christ in the millennium will be on the earth, the Holy Spirit will have its function, but it will be different and lesser. And it will, in fact, be utilized to enhance the emotional response of appreciation of believers. One great thing about the millennium that has not happened in any dispensation prior, however, will be the fact that there will be no religion. Since religion is the devil's ace trump, religion will be wiped from the face of the earth. In the millennium, you'll never find a religious person. You'll find an imitation, as time goes on, of the spiritual life. An imitation, man-made imitation. But all of that is part of dispensational theology and something that we'll study at a later date. Now in 1 Timothy 3.16 it says, Beyond all question, the mystery from which the true unique spiritual life springs greatly. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nation, nations, and was believed on in the world and taken up into glory. So in this dispensation of the church, angels are observing us. They are observing this Bible class right now. One good thing about experiencing eternal life outside of this body that becomes weary is that we will never tire. 1 Corinthians 4.9 And the angels never tire. We need sleep. If we don't sleep, we die. 1 Corinthians 4.9 For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe to angels as well as to human beings. During the early church, for those who were apostles, most were martyred. One who wasn't martyred, although according to church history, an attempt was made on his life, an unsuccessful attempt would be John John lived out to be a very old man. Possibly, he lived more than a hundred years. We know he definitely lived into his 90s. Then in Ephesians 3.10 it says, His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. In the heavenly realms, of course, refers to that which is going on in the angelic conflict in heaven. 1 Timothy 5.21 I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. The Apostle Paul is instructing young Timothy on how to use his gift of pastor-teacher appropriately. Timothy did not have the gift of apostleship, but pastor-teacher. And the Apostle Paul, as head of all the churches at the time, made it very clear to Timothy what he must do. In fact, it's very strong, for he was charged to do this in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels. 
That was to show Timothy the importance of his responsibility as a pastor teacher to keep these instructions without partiality, that is to treat everyone in the congregation exactly the same, no partiality toward one or another person, and to do nothing out of favoritism. One thing Timothy had a problem with was putting the woman on a pedestal. That's because he was raised by women in an environment in which the women by which he was being raised were great believers. His father was an unbeliever who left. He never got to know his father, and that's for good reason. He was always under the authority of women. So when teaching the church, and it would ruffle the women's feathers, he almost by instinct would want to listen to their concerns, which were not concerns at all, but the simple reaction of the woman to the word of God, for she either responds or reacts, for the woman is a responder. That's why in many passages, and in one passage in particular, the Apostle Paul says the woman should keep silent in church because as a responder, there's a tendency for the woman to want to talk out loud, to speak her concerns, no matter who's in authority. Now men do this too, but According to Paul, women did it more and became a problem. Not that women are a problem, absolutely not. In the early church, most of the churches were filled with women, far more than men. Women responded to the gospel all throughout the world disproportionately to men. Some of the martyrs in the early church were women. And even then, as today, even the Romans wanted to avoid the execution of women, as vicious as they were at times. We avoid that even today in our country, even when it's well-deserved. 1 Peter 1.12, now it's not to down the woman in any way, it's just that the man and the woman are different, it's a fact of life, the woman is not lesser than the man, the man is not greater than the woman when it comes to the spiritual life. There is authority, but being under authority doesn't make you a lesser person, I'm under authority doesn't make me a lesser person. Everyone's under authority. It doesn't make them a lesser person. And when the woman marries, she immediately is under, under the authority of her husband, as per Scripture, as per the Word of God Almighty. Andy didn't write this. Andy couldn't write this. Andy is too stupid to know even how to begin. In fact, it's much easier to be under authority than it is to be in authority because when you're under authority, there's a responsibility transfer to the person in authority Meaning when you're under authority, you have fewer responsibilities. Save one, you obey the authority. I've always found it, for the most part, in my life, very easy to follow authority. So all you do is follow instruction. That's my only responsibility when under authority. Follow instruction. 
when placed in authority, there's more responsibilities. Because I still have to follow instruction, but then I have the responsibility to provide a setting of discipline, to be responsible enough to keep dishing out the Word of God, to tend to the flock, to watch you very carefully, to see if you're listening and if you're catching on or if you're not catching on, or if the sheep start to wander away, to raise my voice, to bring them back, or when they're listening contently, just to keep going. All sorts of things that have to be put into consideration that if I were sitting there, I would not even have to think about. So it's not demeaning to be under authority. And I would never ever put down the woman. Because for me, she is on a pedestal. She just has different roles in life and even different roles in the spiritual life. Sometimes women love to be teachers. Sometimes they have a natural gift for teaching. And I've known of women, I've seen women in their frustration, wishing that they could, wishing so and desiring so much to have the what's what are considered the vi a visible gift such as especially gift of pastor teacher and so many women covet that gift if you knew what went into such a gift a visible gift you wouldn't desire it at all and Women do have a natural teaching ability, some women. Some women are utilized very well in the area of teaching young people in a way that a man could not do. That's why in Sunday school, you'll see women teaching the little children because they have a way of explaining things to a child that they would understand. While a man might have an awfully hard time explaining to a child the simple concept of salvation by grace. Much less the more in-depth doctrines man might go in there and look at a bunch of four-year-olds and say, Pistuo epitome corion kai so they say su, and then the kids have no clue what's going on. It's a very difficult thing to teach children. If I had to, I would definitely try it. I mean, if it were part of my, it is part of my responsibility as a father to teach my child but uh, as far as teaching a group of children, I think a woman could do it a lot better than I ever could. So you're not lesser than. You're very important. And as far as your unique spiritual life, you're equal with a man in terms of how far you can go. And in human history, it has been the woman who has responded most to the gospel, and the woman who has responded most to Bible doctrine. So don't ever feel as if you've been left out. In fact, the influence of Christianity has brought about some of the greatest times in all of human history for the woman in the Roman Empire, she went from being looked at as cattle to by the time of the Roman Empire's peak and thereafter, 
she was looked at as being equal or nearly equal to the man. During these times in which we live, she is looked at being equal to the man and in some cases has gone on and utilized responsibility in a stronger way than the man, especially during these times of degeneracy in which men are having children out of wedlock and taking no responsibility for the child or anything else. And even if the woman does not want to marry the man, even after she's impregnated, the man still has a responsibility to provide for the child and he, he's out of there. And in most cases, for the normal woman, she's more than willing to have the father stick around normal cases. What's normal anymore? We've lost our natural affection in many ways in this country. That's all part of the social degeneration under the cycles of discipline. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Let me repeat that last sentence in that verse. Even angels long to look into these things. Into what things? the unique spiritual life of the church age and what is involved in the Musterion doctrines, those doctrines reserved for the church age because they are so deep that even angels learn Bible doctrine from mere human beings. That's why angels are watching this Bible class right now and angels do not tire. And they long to hear it. They want to hear these deep doctrines. They learn from these deep doctrines. They clap and shout and praise the Lord when they hear these deep doctrines because it reinforces what they already know concerning the integrity of God and the choice they made in eternity past to become an elect angel. The longing for the Word of God, the desire to learn the Word of God, to be in such a state as to be like a dog longing to come inside after a hot day's play during the dog days of summer, their tongue hanging out, wagging their tail, the back patio, for example, looking in through the sliding glass door, longing to come in, eager to come in. Believe it or not, there are people like that in the world eager to hear one little piece of Bible doctrine, longing for it, trying to get it in every way possible. And because it's not taught in certain areas, they may go off and they may go astray because Satan always has had the jump on us in the area of missionary activity and the Pentecostals have surrounded the world with their emotional message and sometimes even through their emotional message the Pentecostal can give the gospel and the people there can believe in Christ And it's happened 
and pockets of Christianity have appeared in all different parts of the world and in spite of the fact that the Pentecostal organization as far as how it works in this country gives out zero in terms of the Word of God. I'll have a report for you if everything comes to fruition concerning some things later on. So the invisible hero fulfills the very purpose for which man was created and confined to planet Earth. We've studied five different impacts of history that the believer has who has gone to spiritual maturity. I'll go over the first five very quickly in order to move on to number six, which we haven't covered. Number one, spiritual prosperity comes from evangelism. The training of, well, that's dealing with uh, the fact of missionary activity. That's number five as part of the impact. But number one, we have a family impact or for those in your periphery, family includes mother, father, daughter, son, sister, brother, all of your relatives. Then you have the impact in your periphery of your social life, your friends, oh, and I forgot to mention under family, even the pets of the righteous shall be prospered. You have your social impact. You have the impact related to, number three, whichever organization you're involved with, symphony orchestra, corporation, bank, military, law enforcement, any legitimate organization in society, blessing by association overflows. You have the fourth impact of blessing your neighborhood, your city, your county, your state, and your nation. And then of course number five was the impact beyond the borders of your nation through missionary activity to those areas where they are blessed by the receiving of the Word of God, not only blessed by the mature missionary from the country from where he lives, but also to the country to where he goes. And number six, Heritage impact. Heritage impact is blessing by association with the invisible hero after his death. Even though such a believer is now absent from the body and face to face with the Lord in a place of no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death, for the old things have passed away. Revelation 21, 4. The heritage of his impact or her impact continues. The impact of blessing by association goes on into the next generation or even the next generation. It is the continuation of blessing by association after the death of an invisible hero to one or perhaps two generations and if you happen to make it as far as David, which is rare, by the way, even though he was an Old Testament visible hero with far less than what we have, it's still rare because David is one of those rare people that come along every 2,000 years. We have Moses, then 2,000 years, then David, then 2,000 years, and then, of course, Christ came, and the Apostle Paul, then 2,000 years, and Colonel Thame, etc., And David's heritage impact was so great that even 400 years after his death, the Lord would hold off on divine discipline on Israel. It's 
Say, because of my son David, I will not do so at this point. But in general, when the believer reaches spiritual maturity, that impact can go down to his son and even his grandson or granddaughter or, or daughter. Could go as far as the two following generations, all the way up to great granddaughter, great grandson. So heritage impact is blessing by association on an individual basis only. This means that the loved ones and possibly the close friends and associates of the invisible hero, regardless of their spiritual status, you see it is the cup of the believer who's executed the protocol plan of God that's overflowing, and they may be, they may be splattered by the blessing that's overflowing from the cup and not even know it. But their blessing will be known in terms of history. Many of the famous people in our history, our rapid development in terms of our technology, even from the inception of this nation. With the development of electricity, for example, the great inventors, the great scientists, the great engineers, all of that was due to the fact that there were people in the pivot of mature believers whose cups were running over and splattered on to their either their ancestors either their, pro their uh, progeny, their children, or their close friends. And as a result, we had and have had and still have remarkable advances in technology. And by the way, North Carolina, it's Ohio that learned how to fly. <laughs> Ohio is the aviation state. I never knew that until I moved here. I lived in South Carolina near the border with North Carolina. I would often make trips to North Carolina to the western part so that I could see the mountains and get out of that ugly red mud that I was so used to seeing. And also during the winter since it snowed so rarely. I like to get a glimpse of some snow and the only way to do it was to ride up to Mount Mitchell, for example, which is 6,800 feet in the air, the highest point on the East Coast. And snow flurries there have been reported in every month of the year. So if ever I wanted to get out of the dog days of summer, and I would do it often, hop in my car, you know, this was back when gas prices were 69 cents a gallon even. And for my little car, the little car that I still have, by the way, my car has been blessed by association. <laughs> I didn't say by me. Don't call me arrogant. There's people listening. Maybe by them, huh? So that, that little car is 13 years old. No, it's more than that. Bought that car in 97. Oh man, it's, it's going to be 20 years old pretty soon. 16 years old right now, 16 or 17. And still hums. Anyway, I would take this car, it's a Geo Tracker by the way, Suzuki engine, and uh, <clears throat> take it up to 6,800 feet in the summer. So I could get some fresh air, some cool air. One, one evening, last night I talked about bears, a bear, I'll talk about a bear tonight too. One, one summer, some friends and I from high school, we had just graduated and uh, it was summer and it was very hot. So. Uh, I suggested that we go camping in the mountains. 
Everyone agreed. Well, all the three people that were going, me and two others. So I drove to Mount Mitchell to the campsite, and it's the time of year of bears in the Smoky Mountains. They don't like heat either. And we set up the tent and did everything. And then that night we had this uh, ranger come around. I was probably 18 or 19. He was giving us instructions on what to do in order to not uh, attract the bears. And there were signs everywhere. Do not molest the bear. Do not molest the bear. And boy, we had a joke out of that. Uh, we're not going to molest a bear. Don't you think a bear would be more likely to molest us? <laughs> and how do you molest the bear anyway? I guess the rabbi tried it. <laughs> it was last night's message, if you missed it. So uh, they, uh, they seem more concerned about the bear, and the more this ranger talked about bear incidents, the more we thought about being molested by a bear ourselves. I don't think he was trying to scare us either. He told us to take all our hot dogs and all of our food and put it in the car. My car was fairly new at that time, and he said, and by the way, we're not responsible if the bear breaks into your car, it's happened on occasion we're not responsible because they smell the food in there and they'll bust out a window and go to town but if you leave that food out they will come snooping around that night it started raining a bit and uh, it had dropped into the lower 50s as it was actually it was a thunderstorm there were severe thunderstorms everywhere but we were way up high and the thunder sounded eerie at that altitude because the lightning would strike from above us. We could, you could see it. As I stood out for a moment to watch in the distance, before it began to rain heavily, I could see the lightning come from above and go below. Very, <laughs> I'm well outside of my frame of reference. And then the echo of the thunder reverberating up against the sides of the mountains made it all the more, well, it would reverberate in weird ways. And it would make it louder in some cases. In some cases, it would just be some odd reverberation off of the mountains and very fascinating. And then uh, I was awakened because it started raining and the somehow the tent had a leak and I happened to be sleeping in the lower end of the tent and in about an inch of water, about to freeze to death, just shaking. And... Uh, about that time, my friend woke up as well. And I kept saying, man, it's cold. Man, it's cold. And I said, I'm thinking about going down into my car and turning the heat on. And he said, shh, listen. We all got quiet. and We heard all around the tent, <coughs> like, a, like a huge dog wasn't a dog. He said, it's a bear. I said, I hear the bear. <laughs> Went sniffing all around the tent. There were some tense moments there, and then when it stopped, well, then we had the tendency to just laugh about it. But I did not go down to my car until at least a little bit of sunshine, sun, until the sun had lit up a little bit, and then I ran down to that car got heated up. It was one of the coldest times of my life, and it was in the middle of the summer. That's because I got wet. But anyway, how did the bear come up? What extension? Where did I go off on that tangent? Let me see if I can find it. I'm talking about heritage, oh, the heritage impact and stuff like that, and Ah, who knows? It was a good story anyway. So heritage impact is blessing by association on an individual basis only. And that means that the loved ones and close friends and associates of the invisible hero, regardless of their spiritual status, believer or unbeliever, winners or losers, 
are blessed by association with the invisible hero even after his death. This is an explanation of the question Jeremiah once pondered. Why do the wicked prosper? Well, Jeremiah did not have the doctrine of heritage impact or the doctrine of blessing by association, but it, he did come to understand it. That's why it says in the Bible, question not why the wicked prosper. Why do they prosper? Well, they prosper on the basis of logistical grace support on the one hand, and on the other hand, many believers who are wicked and many unbelievers who are wicked are prospered simply because they were in contact, close contact with, or in the periphery of a mature believer. A mature believer who has possibly passed on. Perhaps that mature believer had a son or a daughter who never believed in Christ. Yet that son or daughter becomes famous, wealthy, gets on national TV and twerks. <laughs> My generation knows what that means. They've been talking about it on the news constantly. It's what Miley Cyrus did at the, uh, whatever, the, little cute, the cute little girl who used to love Mickey Mouse. Her values have changed, obviously. <laughs> twerking, twerking definitely looks vulgar. I'll show it to you at some point. It's all over our culture. It is vulgar. I don't know. During your generation, did you have any form of uh, dirty dancing? And they called it dirty dancing. <laughs> well, we have uh, all types of dirty dancing, and it's actually entered into our English lexicon. It will be in the Harvard's Dictionary. It will be in Webster's Dictionary, the new, the new one, called twerking. And they go into the etymology of the word, which kind of shows our degeneration. And uh, the etymology of the word comes from working it, or work it girl, as they used to say. And then they just kind of combined a T in there somehow to where it became twerking and uh, I'll show it to you sometime most people know what I'm saying the older generation don't bother looking it up it, it, it's vulgar it's dirty dancing so anyway the failure to become an invisible hero means that you lose out on the fact that you can change history. You've not utilized the power of the Spirit, nor metabolized Bible doctrine. You become arrogant, for example, and think you can sit down and read the Bible for yourself and execute the protocol plan of God, and that's ridiculous. That'd be like trying to study calculus without ever having studied algebra or ever having studied addition or subtraction. Because the Bible begins with the basics, addition of, and subtraction. Uh, first of all, you have to be entered into the school. The prerequisite is faith alone in Christ alone. And then uh, once you're in the school, you start to learn the basics, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, fractions, decimals, on and on and on to where all of a sudden math starts introducing letters 4x equals 12, x equals 3. And then it'll get to the point to where there's two equations, one on one side and one on the other, and you have to make them equal each other with all sorts of letters. That's an advancement in algebra, algebra 2 they call it. There's trigonometry. 
which you learn how to figure out the length of a side of a triangle without having all of the information available but you can do it there's a system all the way to calculus which would just blow your mind there are you learn negative integers and positive integers you learn all sorts of things and guess what for those of you who went through school and did all right and learned these things and then went to college and even learned calculus and moved on from there learned some physics guess what you had a teacher or a professor did you not yes you did well the Word of God is no different you need a teacher you need someone who spends his life studying the Word of God rightly dividing the word of truth so that you can understand it so I'm your professor your teacher and really the only thing I do I can I consider it a chef really a, a, as a chef preparing a meal sometimes my meals since I'm just a man I might put a little bit too much salt one night another night I might be tired and leave out the salt entirely one night I might be a little too jazzed up and just put all types of spices in there you don't like but as it were I'm a chef preparing a platter for you to eat and then you from your own volition decide whether to eat it and metabolize it or to take a taste of it and spit it out or to simply throw the plate back in my face and talk to me after class about it <laughs> some people tried that in the past I bet they wish they hadn't don't throw the food back in the chef's face that's rude if you don't like someone's food what do you do as Luke told us what to say my son my four-year-old son somebody one member of the family said I don't like that and Luke said no no that's not the way you're supposed to say it you're supposed to say I don't particularly care for that or I don't care for that as a more polite way so it'd be much easier for me for a member of the flock or somebody who just comes in and out to simply say I don't care for that and to leave their plate behind but some people are rude and they will come and receive a free meal from someone if it doesn't taste right they'll I don't like this throw it into the face of the chef who made it it's terrible or I don't like this can you redo it or it's taken you far too long to prepare this meal could you shorten your meal preparation next time woe to the rude person <laughs> that's all I have to say I've never been so upset as when someone has told me how long to preach or, how, or that I preached too long or that I took too long creating the serving oh yeah I got out of fellowship I'm a man but it was rude anyway I won't rehash that I'm just giving you an example so uh, that person will never ever visit my restaurant again <laughs>
<laughs> Be glad to serve them if they ever came back. Maybe the restaurant's a little better now. <laughs> oh, Life is a learning experience. You should be able to laugh about it. Anyway, I said it would be short. I'm going to keep my promise. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us, challenge us to what we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.